right, our next presenter is Tad Dale. Tad is a registered professional engineer with a 42-year career in the mining business. Tad earned a Bachelor of Science in Mining Engineering from the Montana College of Mineral Science and Technology, now Montana Tech, in 1973. Before his retirement in 2015, Tad was employed by numerous companies, including Anaconda Company, Pfizer, Pegasus Gold, and Montana Resources, as well as a consultant on a variety of projects. He's also been a member of the Society of Mining Engineers, holds a first-class blasters license, has been on the executive board of Montana Tech, the Montana Tech Foundation Board, and in 2000 received the Dis Distinguished Alumni Award from Montana Tech. He was deeply honored in 2018 to receive the Uno Sanhein Silver Medallion Award from the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, and he also served on the State Groundwater Assessment okay. and Steering Committee as an industrial user rep, user rep. In 1981, at the age of 30, he was elected president of the Montana Mining Association. He's still a member of the Montana Mining Association Board of Directors and felt his emphasis was always looking out for the individual small miner. He's drafted legislation that was passed into law as part of the Metal Mine Reclamation Act and served uh, for six years on the Envi Environmental Quality Council as an appointed public okay. member. Okay. Join me in welcoming Tad. Oh, thank you very much. It's kind of <clears throat> this is a little bit off the beaten path of what this conference usually talks about, but <clears throat> Susie called me and she said, hey, would you do a talk on how do some miners from Twin Bridges, Montana get on TV? <laughs> so it, that's the theme of this is, and uh, since I only have 30 minutes, um, I've got some video which um, is a little bit different than if anybody's, how many in this room saw any of, it was called American Gold, The Legend of Bear Gulch? A few of you have. <clears throat> so, um, of course, all of the uh, discs that we, or the, the sessions that we, there were 20 uh, session discs, two seasons, 10 each season, and all of that information was protected by the, by the guys who, once you put the mic on and start the day filming, they own everything. They own everything you say, everything you do. So um, it, in a roundabout way, we got, it, we got some video on here. Um, so to answer the question that Susie asked me is how did we get on TV? Um, I, I have a lot of my family came to support me today and I have four brothers and four out of the five of us are mining engineers and my brother John's probably the, better, the best miner in the bunch. So, uh, and then there's, he has two sons, brother John, mining engineers. I have a daughter that's a mining engineer, so there's eight of the Dale family that graduated from Montana Tech in mining engineering. So we had, um, the, they came to us. We didn't go seeking it out. In fact, they told us, you guys, you don't have any understanding of how many people want to get on TV, and you guys are kind of backing up. And the thing that, that hooked us was they said, well, we'd help you fill or fund a mining budget. Ah, okay, now you're talking our business. So, so we worked out a deal with them, and um, it, that was with Warm Springs Productions, who's out of Montana, and then they eventually, um, I'm going to show this, they called a sizzle reel, you'd call it a trailer, and they did that in 2019, and then they went shopping, and Fox Business picked it up, which is when they told me, I said, Neil Cavuto? You know, what does that have to do with? But Fox was trying a new venue, and uh, we were one of the f five programs that they picked out of. I don't know how many they looked at. So that's how the genus, how it started. And they, we had two years, and um, so that was 20 episodes. Uh, we, we had a great time. We got some things done. We, we had enough money to hire some contractors. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we're all in, in our 60s or 70s, so, it, you know, that kind of running a jack leg isn't our idea of fun. 
but uh, and, and one of the things that they liked about it was when COVID was at its peak and a lot of the um, production shows had been shut down. I'm sure, you know, I've, it's kind of a God thing to me that how they came about this, but, and so they needed something out in the boondocks and here we were out in Montana in the middle of nowhere with, with a lot of private land and they didn't have to get permission from anybody. So it was a plus on their side and a plus on our side because we had all these dreams and we sat around the table and we drank a little bit of whiskey too, talking about what we were gonna do and, and this gave us an opportunity and some money to, to uh, pursue some of that because frankly, you're not gonna sit around the five of us and kick 20,000 bucks in a kitty and say, let's go mining. I mean, you, you, the old saying, you mine till you go broke. So anyway, it was a, it was a win-win for all of us. But so I'm going to start with the trailer and then uh, get into some some of the activities that we did. And one of the things that I we I think we're all proud of, we opened up a mine at it that had been abandoned or it had uh, been abandoned, but the the weather had gotten it and it was all caved in. And it, but the brow of the hill, the hard rock, was probably close to 100 feet or 75 feet from where we felt it was safe to start working because the it, sides of the hill came in on it. And um, we decided that if we, my son is a very good equipment operator. Well, so was, so was Brian, the other son, my brother's son. But we, he, made, he got up, kind of made himself a dirt pedestal and then dug down in the rock face until he broke into the old adit and then started pulling muck out of there. And it, it unfortunately, it was wet. And to dig blind and try to dra dig track grade is quite a feat. So we pre-constructed the mindsets. And a mindset, to any of you who don't know, is a two posts and a cap separated by a standard mindset is like a little over five feet. And so two posts in a cap and two posts in a cap make your mindset. And, and then lagging is just rough lumber, pretty heavy to enclose yourself t t so you're working under safety. And so we, we prefab those on the dump and then we, we chained them up and hauled them in and with my son with this, the excavator swung them in place and we set them in and we basically built from the, from the mountain out. Because if we'd have done it the other way, we'd have, we'd have had to muck for 75 feet and, so, and not been safe. So that was kind of innovative for, for small mines and that's my contribution to the Mine Design Conference. <laughs> Our love for this part of the country is based on our childhood and our family history right here in this canyon. Uncle's born. It's a family legacy going back three, four generations now. This has been our home and our family's home forever. The land itself is part of me. It makes up who I am. My granddad, my dad, my uncles, they were miners. They were the ones that taught us the ABCs in mining. We all made a good living through our careers, working somebody else's dream. But we wanted to have our opportunities to pursue the family legacy. We formed this family-held corporation. Each one of us had to kick in our life savings, really. We started buying these mining claims in our backyard here. And we basically bought our legacy back. We walked over all these claims since we were little kids, but we didn't own them. And now we own them. If you tallied up all the claims, it's probably five, 600 acres. And so there are all these 
possibilities out there, both sides of the valley and three mountain ranges. The past generation left a lot of gold in these mountains. And that's what we would like to get is the rest of that gold. Our dad told us a story about a rich vein of ore. What's this stuff here? Paul, can you shine your light on this? And nobody to this day has ever mined through there. If it lives up to its reputation, it would be a life-changing type of find. Could be the saving grace for the next generation. Holy smokes. We're hoping to pass on this legacy of Bear Gulch to the next generation. Hard to believe that it hadn't been open in how many years? Over 100. It is my responsibility as the fifth generation to keep this legacy and this dream going. Look at all these legends that we've heard for years and years, and here it is. This portal's been closed for 80 years. It caved in here at the surface. Mandatory that we get this open back up and rehab. It could be just a little pot of ore that means nothing. But we owe it to our family heritage to find out. We need to put this to rest. Our grandfather mined up and down this gulch. My dad and his brothers and my mom's dad and her brothers mined here. It's in our blood. Hitting it rich is something that drives everybody. And you're hoping you open the treasure chest. Fire and hole. Oh, okay, that was the sizzle reel that they that they peddled to Fox Business. So where's Kevin at? Oh. Oh, he's gonna do it for me, okay. I think you have to go back to the, well, there you go. It takes a little time. And then hit enter twice. Dick was my dad, our dad, so. These are snippets taken off of the- Group of brothers, episodes. we've got these mining properties that we acquired. Let's talk about what we can do with our limited budget. Well, the biggest deal would be to open up the mountain. Rick, John, Tad, Paul, and Kid Dale have a lot on their table. After 40 years working for mining companies around the world, they've come home to Bear Gulch, Montana and pooled their life savings to purchase over 60 abandoned mine claims here. The Bear Gulch mines are over a century old born of a gold boom that brought thousands to Montana in search of fortune. The old timers pulled millions out of this mountain. But in World War II, the Strategic Minerals Act sent the price of gold spiraling and the mines have been shut down since. We researched all the historical information, built models and identified what we believe is another ore body that was never developed. There were early mines all over the mountain that had very rich veins of gold, small, but extremely high grade. And like fingers on a hand, those come back to a feeder system. The deep ore, the feeder system, it's worth tens of millions of dollars. But it takes a lot of money to get that out. And that's the Dales estimate it will cost half a million dollars to reach the deep ore, money they don't have. We all know that mining is capital intensive and we have the resource, we have the property. What we don't have is a big pocketbook of money. We combined our assets and actually had to mortgage some, some of our properties and homes so we, we have a finite budget that we're working off of. If we could 
get a showing and get a little money in the kitty, you know, then we could start looking at bigger things. So the, the best story, as we all know, is all these oh, gold. Yeah. Well, now that the, the family has acquired these patented mining claims, we have a, a long range plan. The first part of that is to look for Oli's gold. Over a hundred years ago, a Norwegian miner happened upon a rich gold vein in these mountains. He was grub staked by a, a local mercantile and he was getting part of the profits, but not what he considered to be the fair share. So he decided to conceal it and return later in life to pursue it for himself. Oli died before he had an opportunity to go back on his own and, and get that. Oli was a friend of the family. Before he died, he passed along the location of this gold deposit to our grandfather and to our father, who knew these mines well, and they in turn passed it along to us. We're trying to prove out one of these family stories. Is it true? Their father, Dick Dale, was obsessed with the idea of Oli's gold but was cheated out of his chance to buy the claims when they were last up for auction 70 years ago. It was in number five, as far as we understand, right at the turn. And that's how dad passed it on to us, you know, half a set to the right of number five. So I've got the inset from that map here, Rick. And look, um, mom wrote that, Dick's dream. You're going to spend the rest of your life working your idea or working somebody else's. You've got to decide what you want to do. All of us work for mining companies all of our lives. Now we're working our idea. In Bear Gulch, Montana, on the 9,000 foot high slopes of the Tobacco Root Mountains, there's a network of long abandoned mines where no one's found gold in decades. But veteran miners, the Dale brothers, just bought them all. We walked over all these claims since we were little kids, but we didn't own them. And now we own them. They grew up here, and they're convinced that the old timers who gave up on these mines missed one of the largest untapped gold structures in the lower 48. The past generation left a lot of gold in these mountains, tens of millions of dollars, even after all the investment. Reaching the deep ore will cost a fortune, but the Dales have an ace in the hole. They've guarded a family legend for three generations of a rich gold vein hidden near the surface of the mountain. And only they know where to find it. If we could get to that, life-changing. Now, to launch a family empire, they're betting everything Good luck. that the legend they believed all their lives now, I'll bet you, that's the hard stuff. Look at that. This could be it. Is true. Three, two, one. Here we go. Fire in the hole. In Bear Gulch, Montana, veteran miner Rick Dale gears up for a new season. 
we're getting started today. We've got some pretty high hopes for this year. Our excitement level's been building all winter. We're ready to start in earnest actual mining. When you're a miner, that's a pretty good, a pretty good thing. Along with his brothers, John, Tad, Paul, and Kit, Rick has spent the last year in the single-minded pursuit of Oli's gold, a legendary gold vein said to be worth millions. Over a hundred years ago, a Norwegian miner happened upon a rich gold vein in these mountains. He was grub staked by a, a local mercantile, and he was getting part of the profits, but not what he considered to be the fair share. So he decided to conceal it and return later in life to pursue it for himself. Oli died before he had an opportunity to go back on his own and get that. Oli was a friend of the family. Before he died, he passed along the location of this gold deposit to our grandfather and to our father who knew these mines well, and they in turn passed it along to us. So through four generations and a hundred years, we finally not only knew about the legend, but we owned the claim. The brothers recently bought over 60 mining claims spread across 800 acres in the Tobacco Root Mountains of Southwest Montana. We bought these claims together and it was a big strain on all of us. A lot of money, second mortgages were taken to acquire the property. That's a big gamble. It's kind of a make or break situation for us. If we don't come up with something, this could be our last season. The purchase fulfills a family legacy that's been in the making for most of the brothers' lives. Our childhood was centered around Bear Gulch. It was a great place to grow up. I mean, we were really excited about finally getting ownership. Basically, it's our heritage. We all worked in various mining operations, major corporations in some cases, and we were always working for somebody else. And now that we're all back here, this is ours. I'm loaded up and I'm ready to go. And that feels pretty good. The Dales have focused their efforts on a cluster of seven mines on the steep upper slopes of the gulch, known as the Pete and Joe claim. According to legend, Ole found his fabled gold vein here at the Pete and Joe number five. Elevation 9,000 feet. Just like all of the mines at Bear Gulch, the number five has long since been abandoned. That is, until last year. We were close. We were damn close to all these gold. Really disappointing. Early in the year, The number five's portal collapsed. Oh, the whole bank came in. And their attempt to reach Oli's gold through the claim's inner workings hit roadblocks at every turn. Trying to get through this mud and it's pulling my boots off and they're hooked to my pants. Let's get the heck out of here. Despite the setbacks, last year the Dales may have landed on their most promising prospect yet. The Pete and Joe number one. Number one portal. This could be our saving grace, boys. And this is our last shot. Pete and Joe at it number one is, is the lowest main level of the Pete and Joe workings. The Dales are pinning their hopes on the theory that Oli's gold extends down through the mountain, potentially as low as the Pete and Joe number one, making the structure even larger than they initially thought. 
And now, after waiting all winter, youngest brothers Tad, Paul, and Kid finally returned to the number one to assess their chances. Well, here we are. Get this open. Well, this up, looks huh? better than I remembered it, actually. When we were in here last winter, though, we checked some of these caps out and found out they were all rotten. We thought we could save some, but we can't. We're going to have to muck all that stuff out. These portal sets were built by an exploratory mining group who tried and failed to develop the number one in the 1980s. 20 years ago, the portal was still open, and John's son, Brian, explored the mine's inner workings, where he made a discovery that the family hopes could lead to Oli's gold. Brian, the next generation down, he had been in number one when it was open and not caved in. And he remembers somebody had written on the wall 25 feet to high grade, and there was a drill hole there. High grade ore means that it's, it's valuable. It has a lot of gold in it, if that is the case, and if it's high grade, and if it leads up to Oli's find. There's real value in the number one, and it doesn't have the problems that three and five have on that really steep hillside. We've got to prove out that hole that says to high grade. It'd be the cheapest way. If we intercept that, then we can do some projections up. You know. Number one is a 250-foot long adit carved in sturdy bedrock. And the family believes they can reach Oli's gold by extending the tunnel 25 feet. But the portal is collapsed, and replacing it is easier said than done. The number one is wedged between two steep slopes of loose rock and soil. These banks are prone to slides, and to protect themselves, the Dales will have to construct a 60-foot-long portal, and they'll have to build it from the inside out. To find Oli's gold, we gone at it from several different avenues now. We jumped from the five to the three and now down to the one. Three, two, one. It looks pretty good. I'm gonna swing. Here we go. It's not something that's been designed by a corporate office. It's all of us trying to put our heads together. That's good. I'm going to start walking. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Set her down about there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sometimes you wonder what in the world are we doing? Whoa. Can we just pop it? Well, we're having fun. Nicely done. Sorry, Sorry boys. Holy. <laughs> We're going to get this thing set by the skin of our teeth. Holy crap. With our hands actually able to reach out and touch the and say so there it is. is. That really nailed it down right there. We have visible gold. That was quite the feeling. We found it. Finally! <laughs> <laughs> to look at that, see that gold, know it's your own gold. Because we've worked for companies and you never had your own. You saw their gold. I still get excited about that day that we found that. That day changed everything we did from then on and everything we will do. I mean, it's it provides the certainty. So now it's it's uh, developing the plan. I mean, I think a, we go back to a, one of our early tenants, which was develop a plan, plan the work, 
and work the plan. And as long as we do that, um, I think we'll we'll be in good shape. We've discussed this many times, and I will reiterate because I have always believed this: five A is the priority and the focus, and that's where we should go. I'm totally with you on the 5A being the priority, but because there's five of us, we do have the opportunity, like for instance, the ice and the B&H, let's, we're gonna handle that come hell or high water next, hopefully it's high water, we get the damn thing melt and get it out of there. And once and for all, find that page connection Well, I'm reminded of what Uncle Hal always said. The best is yet to come. Okay, that was uh, gives you an idea of what <clears throat> two seasons of work did, and it was exciting to work with each other. Um, five guys working together you don't always get along but we were pretty careful not to put it on the tape that was strapped our, to our hip because uh, they were into drama and we weren't and uh, we called it a docu follow not a docu drama um, I wanted to give some shout outs to uh, Marty Saluso he was uh, helped us the first year with his construction and anybody knows Marty if He'd say, oh, I've got that back at my, uh, my garage or my workshop. And he, I mean, that guy's got everything on the face of the earth with mining. Jerry Stacy's another tech grad. He lives over in the Spokane area, and he um, was the one in 1984 that actually was hired to reopen some of that. He gave us a, a lot of the maps. Um, my nephew, uh, Brendan, worked on a senior project, and he got a hold of Jerry to get some of the background information. Ron Huckabee, uh, he's in Butte. Uh, he did a lot of the surveying, and a lot of the survey pins are still in the mine. John Childs, he's here somewhere. And he came over and helped us out on some identifying some of the sulfur. The, the, we were in the oxides, but now and deeper in that number one, we've gotten into some sulfides. Um, Montana Bureau Mines, uh, John Medish was really great opening up the records. Uh, John Dick here in Butte, uh, he, we bought the mine timbers from him, and he was excellent on getting them to us when we needed it. My daughter, Shannon, helped me edit this thing. It's difficult. It, it, it would have been easy if we just played the discs and copied it, but it didn't happen that way. Chris Christofferson um, is actually an assay office in Smelterville, Idaho. I recommend him if anybody's wondering where to go for an assay. He's excellent. He's actually a referee assayer, which they're the best you can get. And he took a whole day with my bro older brother and I to go through some of our samples. And actually, if you've seen the episodes, we actually poured a, a button at the end. And Dirk Gibson it was actually, he's out of Great Falls, was the idea man that came up uh, to begin with. Actually, he, he had got a hold of my son and uh, some other people, uh, friends, were doing an extreme snowmobile show. And I don't. I didn't want to know where they went because to me it was Avalanche City. But, but they they had a terrific sizzle reel. But it was just one of those things that nobody picked it up. Discovery or Netflix or whatever. And he asked Jeremy. He said, "You got anything else down in that country?" And Jeremy said, "Well, I've got some uncles that are miners and they've got some property." And he said, "Yeah, I'd like to have a gold mine because, you know, Alaska gold and all these gold shows were pretty hot." And and so. Um, Dirk was the one that signed us up really for the sizzle reel and promoted it. So he he was the first one in the door. And Warm Springs Productions and Fox Fox, we didn't have anything to do with Fox. That was that was but they they did pick it up and, and ran it. And um, one other name that I missed on here and I got thinking this morning was uh, Frank Reed. He actually is a a cat skinner in the Butte mine here. He's from Twin Bridges, a good friend and he showed up on the property a couple days and uh, actually bladed a fine grade on our, our road. So, so those are people that helped us. A uh, couple, there's some redundancy, as you saw in some of those cl clips. There was one real error to anybody that knows that 
the Strategic Minerals Act of World War II, the price of gold did not go up and shut down the gold mines. It was because it was a non-essential mineral under the War of Powers Act that shut down all of the gold mines. If, it, if that was your primary product out of a mine, they, sh they were all shut down. And it, it did change the world forever, obviously World War II, but in my mind, it actually left a lot of gold out there for the sec this generation of miners because those mines were, they were busy all of mining and they had to shut down and they, a lot of them were never reopened because of economics and, you know, the old saying, you know, how are you going to keep them down on the farm when they've all seen Paris? Uh, so they didn't go back to work. So, so we had a lot of fun. Um, we were blessed, um, I think, but there's no coincidences in God's world that brought this to us. And, and uh, like my brother Kit said, the best is yet to come. I guess that's in God's hands. Um, one of the things that we, when we first started this program, after watching all those Alaska gold shows, is we had some goals. One was to not have any profanity or as little as we could because we wanted it a family show. Two was to promote Montana Tech. And, you know, three, to show that basically the mining industry isn't in, well, you saw a pick and shovel miner, but that's not the way it is today. And uh, in fact, when one time we were in our tent or going over some maps and the film crew wanted to do something, we say, hey, you know, you guys, we do have computers, and we've got some calculators here. So, I mean, it's, uh, so it was interesting, all five of us kicking in on, on the ideas, and um, we're, I think we're really proud of what we did. It gave us uh, a new feeling for, for our childhood and set us up, in my mind, for a decision that we all have to make again, if we want to proceed with, we, it's going to take enough money. It's going to take money, so that's like a third party, and to develop it to its full extent. But I've le read a lot of reports, history, historical reports, and I have to say, and my family, and my dad, and my granddad were all pragmatic. They were not rainbow chasers. And we were all raised that way, but I have never been discouraged by any of the reports I've ever read. And the biggest thing that all these mining companies that preceded us, they all ran out of money. And, but they did push a lot of tunnels in that we're at, and, and there was divided ownership. Uh, now it's all one ownership. So there's a lot of um, gold on the horizon. So thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Dad. I think we'll just do maybe two questions, and we're running a little bit late for lunch, but we'll take a couple questions for Tad and then additional questions. You'll have to chase them down at lunch or something. Thanks, Tad. Uh, just, just a comment. I, I found the series really entertaining. And I also thought it was a really effective tutorial on how to reopen an old mine safely, you know, with, with a limited budget, limited tools. Uh, it was just entertaining to see a bunch of old guys solving problems and, and nailing timbers together. Well, and, and I haven't seen the end of season two, so don't spoil it for okay. me. Okay. <laughs> well, Warren, uh, thank you for that comment because, um, you know, we, we were all – uh, in mining companies that, that emphasize safety, and, and my brother Kit was probably the, the lead on our safety. And we, you know, we always went to work every day and said, if anybody get hurt, none of this is worth it. So thank you for noticing that. Dad, thanks for the presentation. Really enjoyed it. I have to ask you, what are your plans for this summer? Are you going to go up and do some <laughs> more uh, driving the drift? <laughs> Well, we, um, we've been up there. The, s the snow is the deepest it's ever been in our lives in the Tobacco Root Mountains. And that number one portal, and I, wish, I, should, have, I should have had an end product of that portal. Uh, if you saw the series, you'd see it. But the, you know, the portal set, the top of it is, is, I had to get on a ladder to put a no trespassing sign above the portal. 
And my son went up there in a snow machine about a week and a half ago, and the only thing you could see was the no in the no trespassing. There's that much snow over the portal. So when that, we, we're going to have a, a powwow amongst us and see what we, what we can do, because there's some unfinished business. All right. Well, thanks, Tad. We really appreciate you coming and sharing about your show. Thanks.